Amen. Amen. Go ahead and take your seats. Good morning. Welcome once again to Whitefields Community Church. We're so glad that you are uh, here with us this morning to worship and to study the word. Middle schoolers, now is the time when you are dismissed. So any middle schoolers in the room with us now is the time. Go ahead and make your way to the back of this room and uh, you'll find your teacher there to lead you to your class. We love having you guys in here with us for worship. And then every week after worship, you guys get to go to your uh, middle school class. So that's time for that now. But those of you who are staying in here with us, please open with me in your Bibles to the book of First Peter. The book of First Peter. So if you're not sure where that's at, it's uh, you find Hebrews in your New Testament. And you're going to go two books to the right. So it goes Hebrews, James, then 1 Peter. If you get to Revelation, you went too far. Okay, so Hebrews, James, 1 Peter, that's where we're at. And just starting last week, we began a new series in which we're studying through the, the letters of Peter. So First and Second Peter, we're studying through them here on Sunday mornings in our study that we've called Pilgrim's Progress. Pilgrim's Progress because Peter refers to us, uh, he makes emphasize this a lot, that we're pilgrims and sojourners in this world. And that knowledge should shape the way that we live. So we're going to begin this morning. We began our series last week. This is our second installment in this series as we're working our way verse by verse through 1 Peter. So we're going to begin by reading our text this morning, which comes from 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning in verse 13. It says this, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear through the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blood blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth from a sincere or for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And the word, this word, is the good news that was preached to you. This is God's word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word, and we ask this morning as we turn our attention to these scriptures, Lord, would you help us to apply them to our lives? Would you help us to understand them? And Lord, would they go beyond just head knowledge? Lord, would this knowledge sink down into our hearts? And Lord, we pray that by your living and abiding word, you would transform us, you would shape us. Lord, you would prepare our minds for action, and you would shape us all the more into the image that you want us to be. Lord, help us that we would be formed in the way that you want us to be formed. And we come to your word now with that sense of expectation that you're going to speak and we're going to listen. So Lord, uh, we pray that you would do that and that we would receive this message and understand it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so two of my kids are now at the age where um, a lot of their peers, like at school, uh, are starting to use profanity, right? They're starting to use bad words. And so the other day, my son and I were talking about this topic, about profanity and bad words. And he asked me, you know, what is it that makes some words bad? Like, what makes a bad word bad? Like, who determines what counts as profanity and what doesn't, right? And so, you know, I told him, well, you know, these are words which people in our society just consider to be so or offensive, right, and so off-putting and so undesirable that they just determine, like we all kind of agree, that these are things that we shouldn't say in public. And so then he asked me, well, so how many bad words are are there? Like, what's the, what's the number? And I was like, well, you know, that's a little bit hard to say, right? Because uh, what counts as a bad word in some places isn't a bad word in other places, and bad words change throughout time, right? And so here in our context from today, uh, from Peter, this text that we just read, we're going to encounter a word which I think some people in our day and age, when they hear it, it makes them cringe, they don't like it. It's one of these words they would say, uh, you know, that's an off-putting word. That's one of those words that we, we shouldn't say out loud. We don't need to talk about that. It's a four-letter word, right? 
And you know what we do sometimes with, with bad words or, or four-letter words is that words that people find particularly objectionable or distasteful is that we don't say the word out loud. We just say like the letter the word begins with and we call it that letter word, right? And so this word I'm going to call the H word. It's here in our text and we're going to talk about it today. And before the service is over, I'm actually going to say it out loud. So I just want you to prepare yourself, right? I don't want you, any of you to be triggered by anything I do, right? So prepare yourself. We're going to say it out loud. It's the H word. That's the title of today's sermon. So there are three things that Peter wants us to understand here in 1 Peter verses 13 through 25. And these are the the following, right? The work of the mind, that's what we're going to talk about first in verse 13. Then we're going to see the end goal of our salvation, the end goal of our salvation. And then finally, we're going to talk about the engine that drives it all forward, the engine that drives it all forward. So Peter begins this section in verse 13 with the word, therefore. Now here's just a pro tip for you guys, you Bible students, right? Here's a pro tip. Anytime you're reading the Bible, just an easy rule of thumb for you to take with you and, and use in your Bible study is this. Whenever you see the word therefore, stop and ask the question, what is that therefore, therefore? Now I realize you're not supposed to end a sentence with a preposition, but I did because it sounds better this way, right? So what is that therefore, therefore? Uh, and when you read the Bible, here's what you'll notice. A lot of times in the New Testament, you'll find the word therefore, right? They'll tell you these, these great lofty theological truths about God, about yourself, about humanity, about the world, and about what God has done. And then they'll throw in the word therefore. And whenever you see that word, you got to stop because the word therefore signals a transition to application. It's a transition to application. So here in 1 Peter, Peter has been telling us, what has he been telling us about the, the greatness of our salvation? How incredibly awesome this salvation is that we have in Jesus because of what he did for us. We, we've been, uh, he's been talking to us about how because of what Jesus did for us, we have the hope of heaven. So no matter what you're facing in your life currently, today, right now, you can live with this knowledge that in Jesus there is hope beyond this life. There is hope beyond beyond the grave. Because of what Jesus did for us, not only are your trials temporary, but they also have a purpose. Do you get that? You get that, right? Not only are your trials temporary, but they even have a purpose. God is using the things that are happening in your life right now to accomplish something that will last for eternity. That will last for eternity. And not only is God working in you to do something great, he also wants to work through you to do work in the world, to do his work. He has a calling and a mission and a plan and a purpose for your life to accomplish his work through you in the world so that other people can know his love, so they can know his grace, so they can have that hope that we have because of Jesus. And so there he says in verse 13, because all those things are true, verse 13, therefore, in other words, circle, highlight, underline that word whenever you come to it, therefore, he's essentially saying this, because these things are true, now here's what to do. Because these things are true, here's what to do. And here's what he says, verse 13, therefore, because these things are true, here's what to do. Prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action, being sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So the first thing we're called to do in light of these things that are true, these things that Jesus has done for us, is the work of the mind. The work of the mind. And this work of the mind, Peter tells us, kind of, he, he breaks it down into three categories, three things that he tells us specifically that all pertain to our minds. So number one, he says, prepare your minds. Secondly, he says, be sober-minded. And thirdly, he says, set your hope. Set your hope. That's a determination of the mind to set your hope. Here's what he says. He says, prepare your minds for action. Now, some of your translations will say this, and I, I like this, actually, because in literally, in Greek, the phrase that he uses to translate it literally is, gird up the loins of your mind, right? Like, how many of you uh, this morning, you thought, I, I need to gird up my loins, right? Okay, well, just, just think about that. Think about girding up your loins. It's a really cool ancient saying. See, here's what it means. To gird up your loins means to prepare yourself for action. And, and here's why. Because in those days, you know, people didn't wear uh, like tight-fitting Italian shirts and skinny jeans with a great sense of, of style and fashion, right? No, what they did is they wore togas and robes, right? Just like loose, drapey clothing, which if you needed to run or you needed to do like construction work or you needed to, to do something um, physical, it was really not, not a good 
thing to wear because it would get in the way. And what it would do is it would trip you up. It would make you stumble. It would, uh, it would cause you problems. It would slow you down. And so if you needed to do action work, right, you needed to do something, what you would do is you gird up your loins, which literally meant you would grab your robe, like between your legs, you pull it up, and tuck it into your belt. You get everything tight, right? You get everything uh, close so that when you run, it's not just flopping around, right? All that drapey clothing isn't just tripping you up and slowing you down and impeding your forward progress. And so how does that apply to our minds? Well, what Peter is saying here is this. He says, mentally, get yourself tight. Get things tight mentally in your thought life. You need to begin to deal with the things in your mind that can trip you up and drag you down and impede your forward progress. So make things tight mentally. Think about athletes, for example. Athletes, of course, spend a lot of time preparing themselves physically, but you know that the best athletes in the world prepare themselves mentally for their challenge. They're preparing themselves for what they are going to do when they face particular challenges or difficulties along the way. And so Peter's telling us to do that. Prepare your mind now so that when you face trials and hardships and temptations, you will be prepared for how you are going to act and react in that moment. And that's a really important thing for us to do. I want you to ask yourself right now, think that through. How will you respond when you're faced with that temptation, that thing that tempts you that you sometimes fall into? How are you going to respond when your faith is put to the test? How are you going to respond if that thing you fear ends up happening in your life? How are you going to respond, on the other hand, when, when God blesses you? How are you going to respond in worship? How are you going to respond in praise? How are you going to share your faith with that person that you've been meaning and intending to share your faith with? Make a plan. Think it through. Prepare your mind. What are you going to say? How are you going to encourage that person that you need to encourage next time you see them? Prepare your mind for action. Prepare your mind. You know, in martial arts, you know, this is one of the things they do, that uh, for years they will practice these repetitive motions, right? Blocks, attacks, and oftentimes they practice them without a partner, just doing motions in the air, right? Like with no partner. Why? Here's why. What they're doing is they're building muscle memory, right? They're building muscle memory so that when they're in the moment, they don't have to, you know, invent something to do. They already know. Their mind has been prepared and trained. They have that muscle memory. It becomes second nature. You remember the movie Karate Kid, right? Like he's like, wax on, wax off. And Daniel's son thinks that Mr. Miyagi just wants him to like wax all his cars. But that wasn't even the point, right? Like Mr. Miyagi is teaching him these repetitive motions so that when he's in that moment, he's got that muscle memory, right? Like paint the fence. And then he's in the moment and then he finds out, oh no, I'm doing the thing, right? Because I trained my mind. I prepared my mind for action. And so how do we do that practically? Well, he tells us it begins in verse 13 by being sober-minded, by being sober-minded. So when we hear that word sober, our minds tend to automatically go to alcohol and marijuana and drugs and things like that. And certainly, if you're drunk, if you're high, you're not being sober-minded. But this term sober-minded, it means more than that, right? It means to be in a place of mental clarity, Mental clarity. Other translations translate this as self-controlled. Self-controlled. And that's important. See, what it refers to here is being focused, being aware. And check this out. It means being in control of your thought life. Being in control of your thoughts. Now, now, for some of you, this might be a revolutionary idea, that this is what the Bible tells you, that you can actually have some say in your thought life. You can be in control of your thoughts. And that that's why he says there in the next part, set your mind on the hope that you have in the gospel, right? Set your hope on this. It's a, it's a will of the mind. What Peter is telling us is that we can be intentional about what we think about. We can be intentional. We can put in effort into deciding what we set our minds on and what we fill our minds with. And by the way, this is a major theme throughout a lot of the New Testament. Let me give you an example. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, Paul says this. He says, Finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there's anything of excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What is he saying there? He's saying this. He's saying that you can... You can be decisive about what, you, what thoughts in your mind you affirm and which ones you reject. In other words, you can have some say in your thought life. And the thing the Bible tells us is that your mind is a battleground. Your mind is a battleground. In fact, the primary place where spiritual warfare takes place 
is in the battleground of your mind. Do you know that? That that's a primary place where the battle of spiritual warfare takes place. For example, Jesus warned us that one of the main ways that the devil attacks us is by whispering lies to us. Jesus said he's the father of lies. It's what he does. He's been lying and he will continue to lie. It's what he does. And so he tries to get us to believe lies about ourselves, about God, about other people. See, we've all experienced those intrusive thoughts. Haven't you ever had that where you feel like, oh my gosh, I feel like I'm being attacked. Like these thoughts aren't even coming from me. And these are destructive thoughts, right, that seem to come at you like an attack that tell you things that are the opposite of what God's word tells you. Second Corinthians, Paul talks about this too. He says, you know, Corinthians, guys, listen, there are, there's a spiritual aspect to the battles that you fight. And the battleground of these spiritual battles is often our minds. And that's why he says there, he says the solution is for us to cast down the lies and to take every thought captive for Christ. And the point is this, that you and I, we don't just have to be hapless victims who are passively riding the waves of whatever thoughts come into our minds or whatever feelings we have. You can choose what you fill your mind with. You can choose uh, which thoughts you affirm and which thoughts you reject. And to put it this way, think about it like this. You can't change your heart, right? Only God can change your heart but you can change your mind. So you can't change your heart, but you can change your mind. And if you change your mind, oftentimes you will find that God will then change your heart. So you can't change your heart. Only God can do that, but you can change your mind. Here's another way to think about it. You can't always choose the way you feel. Have you ever noticed that? You feel a certain way. Maybe you wish you didn't feel that way. Here's the thing. You can't choose the way you feel about someone or something. But you can control the way that you think about that thing. Okay, so you can control the way you think about that person or that thing. And here's the deal. If you change the way that you think, oftentimes your heart will follow. The, the feelings will follow in time. And so Peter tells us here, he says this, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Again, remember who Peter's speaking to. He's speaking to people who are hurting, people who are struggling, people who are suffering, and he tells them to set their hope, set their minds fully on the grace that will be revealed to them. This is interesting because he encourages them not to set their hope on anything in this life, but to have their hope fully set and secure in heaven, on the heavenly hope. See, here's the deal. If you set your hope on anything in this life, you are going to be discouraged. You're going to be disappointed. Peter's telling these guys, look, I cannot promise you, I will not promise you, that if you give your life to Jesus, then everything's just going to get better and all your problems will go away. They might not. You know, for many of these people, becoming a Christian is the very thing that made their life harder. See, Peter's reminding us that the hope of the gospel is not the promise of an easy and comfortable life here and now. It's the promise. It's not the promise that all of your wishes will be granted. It's something bigger than that and something better than that. See, the hope of the gospel is the promise of God's grace to you both now and forever. God's grace to you both now and forever. Grace you know what that is? That is a gift. It is undeserved, unmerited favor. It's the favor of God in your life that you don't deserve, that you haven't earned, that you haven't merited. It's given to you as a gift, right? God's favor, his, his smile upon you, his grace towards you, his blessings in your life. See, God's grace isn't only that God spares you from judgment. It's more than that. It's that he blesses you and he pours out favor on your life. See, experiencing God's grace is the essence of what it means to be a Christian. Experiencing God's grace, that's what Christianity is about. He shows us grace in the past by sending Jesus to us. He gives us grace here and now by blessing us and giving the strength to do what he calls us to do. And he promises us grace in the future. That's what he's pointing to here. Paul is pointing to the grace that will be revealed to you. When this life is over, we get to enter into his eternal glory. It's grace past, present, and future. That's the whole of the Christian life. It is grace from beginning to end. So in light of what Jesus has done for us, in light of the grace of God that we are experiencing here and now, in light of the grace that will be revealed to us, the hope that we have of heaven and the grace that is to come, Peter tells us, do the work of the mind. So you could ask the question, 
Okay, so, but why? Why? What is the point of this? In other words, what is the end goal? To what end should we do this work of the mind? What, what is the end goal? What is the purpose of all this men mental work? Well, Peter's going to tell us that starting in verse 14. But here's the thing I want you to notice first. Before Peter tells us what to do, he tells us how to think. Before Peter tells us what to do, he tells us how to think. And that's really important because how you think affects the way that you live practically. That's why Paul says this in Romans chapter 12. He says what we need is to be renewed in our minds. We need to have our minds renewed. And how does that happen? How do we have our minds renewed? Well, Peter's going to tell us that before we get to the end of our study, but he doesn't tell us quite yet. So hang on, make a note. He's going to talk about how our minds are renewed a little bit later on. But before we get to how our minds are renewed, he's going to talk to us about the end goal of our salvation, the end goal of our salvation in verses 14 through 22, really the heart of this text. So what is the action that Peter wants us to do in light of the gospel? What is the action? Uh, what is the action that we're to be preparing ourselves for and, and doing the work of the mind in order to accomplish? What is the action? Here it is in verse 14 and 15. He says this. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but... Be holy in all of your conduct. Be holy in all of your conduct. There it is. It's that four-letter word, the H word, right? It's holy. See, it's, it's, I think it'd be hard to find a less popular word in our society today. I know some people, when I said, okay, we're going to talk about the H word, some people thought, oh, an unpopular H word would be hell. I got to tell you, I think hell is actually more popular than holiness, right? We, I, I've told you before that our ser recent sermon on hell, their number one most popular sermon on iTunes podcasts, right? It's like people like to tell other people to go there. People hope that, uh, you know, really bad people will end up there. There's a way in which hell is more popular, I would say, as a topic than holiness, See, when it comes to holiness, I think for many people, it, it, it just consider, it's considered very off-putting, right? Maybe it evokes images in your mind of like an old man shaking his finger at you with a scowl on his face, or like an old lady who's frumpy and grumpy and doesn't have any fun, and if your ball goes in her yard, she's not giving it back, right? And maybe it reminds you of somebody who's holier than thou, right? Judgmental, unkind, condescending, probably hypocritical. Now, that might be how people feel, generally about the word holiness, but that's not what holiness is about at all. See, holy isn't haughty. Holy is happy. That's how I would put it. Holy isn't about being haughty. Holy is happy. And how many of you want to be happy? Guys, I got to tell you, I've met a lot of people who aren't happy, but I've never met somebody who doesn't want to be happy. So check this out, because this is really good news for us. If we want to be happy, which we all do, there's a clear and simple pathway that God has given us to happiness, and that is holiness. Now my guess is that some of you inside, you're kind of rolling your eyes, right? Or you're kind of like, yeah, okay, whatever, because uh, it doesn't, holiness doesn't sound like uh, a lot of fun to me. Well, think about it like this. Uh, think about some unholy things that people consider to be a lot of fun or really enjoyable or pleasurable. Now, think about the long-term effects of those things. And I would say that without exception, those unholy things that people consider to be so fun or pleasurable, without exception, they lead to destruction, isolation, pain, suffering, and hurt and loss. And not just for one person, but it's like throwing a rock into a pond, right? It has a ripple effect that keeps going after that initial splash. On the other hand, right, holiness is the pathway to happiness, that deep, true, full, satisfying a feeling that all of us long for deep down. Now check out the relationship that it says there is between holiness and happiness in this verse in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 9. I'll show it to you. Uh, this is speaking about Jesus. And notice the relationship here between holiness and happiness. It's speaking about Jesus, and it says this. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond all your companions. 
Here's the deal. Jesus was the holiest person who ever lived. We're told in several places in the Bible that Jesus lived a holy life without sin. But what this verse tells us is that not only was Jesus the holiest person who ever lived, he was also the happiest person who ever lived. He was anointed with the oil of gladness above all his companions. So Jesus was the happiest person who ever lived. He was also the holiest person who ever lived. And the two of those are related to each other. In other words, his happiness was a direct result of his holiness. The, the reason he was the happiest person who ever lived, it says there, is because he loved righteousness and hated wickedness. I mean, just think about it. Every problem that exists in the world today can be traced back to human sin. It's the result of human sin. Every issue that we face as a society, everything that causes you pain personally, it can all be traced back to human sin. Sin leads to shame, isolation, pain, loss. And so you might ask, well then, if it's such a bummer, then why does anybody do it? And there's a really easy answer because it is pleasurable for a moment. The only problem with sin is that the pleasure really does only last for a short time, but then you're left to deal with the repercussions, the fallout. It's kind of like, I call it like chocolate-covered anthrax. Hey, you want some chocolate-covered anthrax? It's sweet on the outside, but it will destroy you. It will kill you without question, without doubt. Conversely, like where, where sin leads to, to all these negative things, right? Holiness is good for us. Holiness leads to wholeness and joy. And so the reason God says, be holy as I am holy, isn't because God is saying, I'm not having any fun and I don't want you to have any fun either. It isn't because he's bored and miserable and he wants you to be bored and miserable too. No, the reason God says, be holy as I am holy, is because God loves you and he wants you to be happy as he is happy. See, holiness leads to happiness. On the one hand, it's because you're not bringing a bunch of junk and nonsense and unnecessary problems into your life. You're avoiding those things which would bring you down and cause pain and destruction and heartache in your life. Think about this. In the very beginning of the Bible, we get a picture, a glimpse, just for a moment, of what life was like without sin. This is what life was like without sin. And the word that's used to describe it is paradise. Paradise. And there, before sin comes into the world, what do we see? We see people living in harmony with nature, people living in harmony with God, people living in harmony with each other. And then sin comes in, and what does it do? It wrecks it, right? Shame, isolation from God and from, a, from each other, and just a myriad of problems. And so for us to pursue holiness is to move back towards that original design, that original good design that God had for us. And remember, in heaven, there will be no sin. And so to be holy is to get a glimpse, a foretaste of what heaven is like. It's for us to get back to the way things were meant to be and a foretaste of how things will be once again, once God sets all things right. To be holy means to be set apart. Holiness means separating yourself from the things which would pull you down and drag you down and, and wreck you. Holiness means being set apart for God and his purposes. And Peter's logic here, he says in verse 14, he refers to us as children. And in verse 17, he refers to God as Father. What he's saying, his logic is this. Just as kids tend to become like their parents, if we are truly God's children, then we will become like God is, and that is holy. But here's what's really interesting. Because the Bible tells us that the end goal of our salvation— Right? What is the end goal? Why did God save you? What is his ultimate purpose with you? Is it just to keep you from going to hell? No, it's something bigger than that, something better than that, something exciting. God's ultimate goal isn't just that you wouldn't go to hell. It's bigger than that. It's better than that. Notice what it says in Romans 8, 29. Here's what it says. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So God's ultimate goal for your life isn't just to save you from hell, as important as that is. God's ultimate goal for you is to make you like Jesus, to make you like Jesus. And think about Jesus, right? People flocked. They, they couldn't get enough of him. They wanted to be around him. Even people who didn't agree with his ideas, they wanted to be around him. He was the most beautiful, most powerful, most joyful person who ever lived. 
People couldn't get enough of him. They're still, even to this day, fascinated with him. And so to, for God to make us like Jesus means that God's goal with your life is to make you into something great. Make you into something great. To make you beautiful and joyful and wise and loving and good. And we have a word for that. Do you know what that word is? Holy. That's the word for that. Beautiful and good and true and right. It's holy. See, God's goal for us and God's goal is for our good. And, it, and therefore, if God's goal for us is for our good and it's to make us great like Jesus, to be holy, well then it should also be our goal for ourselves. That's what Peter's telling us here. If this is God's goal for you, well then let it be your goal as well. And here's what that means for us practically. You and me, we need to be intentionally formed. Intentionally formed. I want you to give some thought to this. Being intentionally formed. Because here's the deal. You're always being formed by a lot of different factors around you, right? It, the Bible uses these words in some of these verses we looked at. It's used the word conformed. It's used the word transformed. In other words, you're always being formed. You're either being conformed to something. You're being transformed from one thing into another. You're constantly being formed in one direction or another. And therefore, we should be intentional about our formation rather than passive about our formation. So here's why I... Uh, I heard this great analogy, and here's the point of it. We always drift towards disorder, right? Don't we? We always drift. If we're passive, we will drift not to order, but we'll drift towards disorder, right? Like if you stop exercising and eating well, you don't just suddenly wake up, you know, two weeks later and you're more fit. No, we, we trend towards disorder unless we're intentional. And I heard this great analogy, and it was the analogy of concrete. You guys ever, maybe you've poured concrete before, or at least you know how concrete works. So the deal with concrete is that uh, it takes on the shape of whatever you pour it into. Concrete, doesn't it? It takes on the shape of whatever you pour it into. So that's what we're like as well. We're like raw concrete, wet, wet cement, right? So if you just pour it out on the ground, what does it do? It just, it's a blob. Is that what you, you know, we, we can be a blob, right? So if you just pour it onto the ground, it'll just be a blob. But if you pour it into a form, it will take on the shape of the form. It will take on the shape of the form that you pour it into. And so here's my question for you. What is the form? What are the forms that you are pouring yourself into? What are the forms that you are pouring yourself into? If you have no forms, right? If you have no spiritual disciplines in your life, if you're not intentionally creating a structure for your life to pour yourself into, then you will just end up as a blob. Uh, but, but here's the value of spiritual disciplines, right? Spiritual disciplines like prayer, church attendance, community group, right? Giving, serving. Each of those things, it's like nailing a board into a form. You're creating a form, taking a board, putting it here, laying it down, nailing them together. You're creating a form that you are going to pour yourself into over and over again. And the purpose of that form is to intentionally shape yourself into the image of Jesus, the image of Jesus, right? These spiritual disciplines, in other words, they're a guide by which you're creating a form for your life, a shape for your life that you'll be poured into that will shape you. And ultimately, the goal of these things, what they lead to is greater joy. Greater joy. Why? Because holiness leads to happiness. And so I'm going to pursue it because I want to take hold of that joy, right? I want to become the person who God wants me to be for my joy, for his glory, for the good of other people, for, for his mission in the world. Now, starting in verse 17, Peter starts talking about the motivation for why we should pursue holiness. Why should we pursue holiness? The first thing he tells us in verses 17 through 19 is this. It says, If you call on him as Father, who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, then conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways inherited from your forefathers, not with, imper not with perishable things as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like the lamb without blemish or spot. Okay, so let me ask you a question. So is God our father, or is he 
our judge? Is he our father or he's, is he our judge? Should we have confidence and intimacy before God or should we have reverent fear before God? And the answer is both. The answer is yes. If, you're, if you have your faith in Jesus, then that fear or reverence before God isn't fear of retribution. It's not fear that, of judgment because Jesus took our judgment for us in our place. But rather, there's a sense of reverence. There's a sense of awe that comes from understanding that your life has been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus. And one day, you're going to stand before God and you're going to tell him what you did with this life that he purchased for you at the cost of his blood. And the idea is this, because you've been so loved, because you've been so embraced, therefore, you want to please your father. You want to please your dad because he's a good dad and you adore him and you want to please him and make him glad. And that sense of reverence, it ought to motivate us to action where you say, I want to do as much as I can with this life he's given me. He bought this life with his blood, so I don't want to waste my time on dumb and fruitless things. I, I want to run this race. I want to fight this fight with all that I've got in me until my last day. See, we, we want to have, it, it should create in us a sense of excitement. A sense of anticipation, knowing that one day we're going to stand before God, not to be condemned because Jesus already paid the price for us, but to show him what we did with these lives that he gave us. To show him what we did with the lives he gave us. I have a daughter who's three years old, and, um, you know, lately I'll come home from, from the office, and she'll have been working all day long creating things for me, right? Like creating a painting. And, she, and here's why. Because she knows that at some point, dad's going to come home. Dad's going to come home and she's anticipating that moment when she's going to stand before me and she'll get to say, dad, look what I did for you and hand it to me and get to see that smile on my face. The reason she puts in all that work is not because she's afraid that I'll be mad at her if she doesn't do it. No, not at all. It's because she loves me and there's a joy in doing this for me she wants to use her time and energy to do something that will make me glad so we can share in that gladness together. And that's the attitude that we, we will have, I believe, towards God all the more, the more we understand the gospel, right? That we look forward to that day when we'll get to stand before him and say, look what I did with what you gave me. He tells us in verse 22 that because our souls have been purified by God, we ought to love each other with earnest love from a pure heart. So in other words, verses 14 through 22, they tell us, here's what holiness looks like. Holiness looks like reverence for God and love for others. Reverence for God and love for others. That's what holiness looks like. That's how it manifests itself in your life. Okay, that brings us to our third and final point, which is this. The engine that drives it all. The engine that drives it forward. Peter's been talking about the work of the mind and how important it is to be renewed in our minds and how important it is for us to grow in holiness into the likeness of Jesus. But the question is, how does that happen practically? Like, how does that actually take place? And what he tells us here at the end of the section is this. It's through the living and abiding Word of God. It's through the living and abiding Word of God. You know, God's Word is alive. It's the engine which drives these things forward, the work of God forward in our lives. And it's the way that he accomplishes and drives his work forward. He works through his word to renew your mind, to form you and make you like Jesus. And so you come to his word, you take it in, you listen to it, you hear it, you, you hear it taught, and you submit yourself to it. That's why, by the way, we give so much attention to the Bible here at Whitefields. We're Bible people. That's what we're about. And the reason is because we believe what it says right here, that God's word stands forever. There are waves of ideas. Everything else comes, and it eventually passes away. But the word of God stands forever. It has survived centuries of attack from the outside. It has survived centuries of neglect from God's people themselves, but the, the word of God endures forever. The essence of that word, he tells us in verse 25, is this. The essence of the word is the gospel. That is the story that all of the stories together tell. That is the story that all of the Bible together tells. And so how do we grow in these areas that we've been talking about? How do you do the work of the mind Here's how, by coming to the Word of God and letting the Word of God shape the way that you think. That's what renews your mind. 
How do you grow in reverence for God? How do you grow in love for others? How do you grow in holiness? Here's how, by coming to the word of God, being reminded of who God is, what God has done, and letting that shape the way that you think, the way that you feel, the way that you live. See, the word of God is the engine, Peter's telling us, that drives these things forward. And so we give our full attention to it. It's a treasure. It's a gift. It is alive. It's powerful. And so I want to encourage you this week, study it, listen to it, apply it to your life. And in conclusion, I just want to say this. Peter has reminded us of something very important here in verse 24. He's, he's quoting from Isaiah chapter 40, verses 6 through 8. He's, he's quoting from the Old Testament when he talks about how, you know, the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of God stands forever. He's pointing us to the fact that God's word is living and abiding. But there's something else that, that's in here, right? The, the point is about how God's word stands. But there's another point that we shouldn't miss in this. It's absolutely vital for us to see and understand. And that's this. All flesh is like grass. And its glory is like the flower of grass. And the grass withers and the flowers fall. Right? Who's that? That's us. We're flesh, right? We have bodies of flesh. And it's telling us not just something about God's word. It's also telling us something about ourselves that we need to know. Life is short. It doesn't last forever. Right? This life is short. See, my wife and I, we have this thing. We always joke about, about flowers, right? Um, like when you give someone cut flowers, like in a vase, and, and you say, hey, here are some flowers. So I never give her cut flowers. I always give her plants. That's just what we do. And the reason is because we always joke that, that when you give someone flowers, you're essentially saying, hey, I found something beautiful in nature, so I killed it and I gave it to you so you can watch it slowly die over the course of several days, right? And as depressing as that might be, uh, Peter is pointing us to that same image. And he's saying, that's your life. You are a cut flower in somebody's vase on their kitchen table, right? You're on the clock. It, you might look nice, but you're looking less and less nice over time, right? Eventually, and it is only a matter of time because you're a cut flower in a vase. You are going to fade, you are going to wither, and you are going to die. In other words, this life doesn't last forever. And that's Peter's great theme in this letter, by the way, that he desperately wants us to hear and understand. Life is short. This is not your final station. So live with eternity in mind. You're going to spend eternity somewhere. Have you ever noticed that you live differently? You act differently when you're visiting a place versus how you act when you live in that place? Right? Like, like when you uh, visit Orlando, Florida, right? Like you, people who live in Orlando, Florida, don't do all those things that you do every day. Why? Because when you visit a place, right, you know, I'm only going to be here for a short time, and I don't know when I'll be back or if I'll ever be back, and so I want to wake up early. I want to fill my days with meaningful activities because I know that I've only got a short window of time while I'm here, and Peter says, that's how I want you to live this life. You're a sojourner. You're a traveler. You're only here for a short time. Don't forget, eventually, this life is going to wither and fall. It will. God's word will stand forever, but your life is short, and it's not going to last, and so Live now like you're traveling through, right? Live with that sense in your mind that there's a short window of time. And what that means is this. Maybe there's some of you who have been putting off, really surrendering your life to God, truly embracing the gospel, truly trusting in Jesus and following him. If that's you, I want to tell you this. Now's the time. Now's the time to do it. Don't put it off. For those of you who have been wasting your time and energy on fruitless nonsense that isn't helping you or anyone, let's pursue holiness. Now is the time. See, the message of the gospel is that the eternal God took on human flesh and he died so that through him, you and I could live forever. That's the good news of the gospel, that Jesus Christ, who was without sin, he took on sins. He became sin so that through him you could become righteous and holy before God. He took on unholiness so that you could become holy through him. And if you put your trust in that, in what Jesus did for you, if you cling to it and rely on it, then even when this flesh fails, you will have hope that goes beyond the grave. May we be those who trust in that truth and respond to it with our lives. Amen? Please stand with me and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this great truth and this good news. And Lord, uh, because this is true, Lord, may we be those who respond and do. May we be those who respond with action. Lord, thank you that you want good for us. And Lord, may we move 
towards that as well. May we create the right forms to pour ourselves into. And Lord, as we pursue you, would you give us a joy that goes beyond our immediate circumstances. Lord, fill us with that joy that comes from walking with you and knowing, with, knowing you and living in your presence day to day. And so I pray that as we leave this place, Lord, help us to live as people who have that sense that we're here for a short time. We've got a short window to, to live for you while we can, to love others while we can. And may we do that with fervor in Jesus' name. Amen.